we go. Super Puerto Rican in here.
we pray, Lord, that you would continue to meet us in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to 16A Community Church. Whether you are here in person or online, we want to say welcome. My name is Carl Fisher. I'm one of the pastors here at 16A Community Church. If I haven't met you, I would love to meet you. If you're online, shoot me a message. I'd love to talk with you. Hey, one of the things that I love about what's happening right now is it's actually the springtime. Uh, things are growing. We've been looking at the blossoms on our trees. The grass is finally coming out and it's green. And it just reminds me of this hope, of this newness, of this excitement. And it makes me think about 1 Chronicles 16, 8, where David is excited about a new story. He's excited about the people of God uh, pursuing God participating in their community as well as proclaiming God to all people. And that is simply where we get our mission statement from, to pursue, participate, and proclaim Jesus to all people. I love that this time is making me think about that. Now on Friday, many of you may have seen that there are new CDC guidelines. We want to just ask you to bear with us. Uh, our leadership team is actually going to be uh, working through that, praying through that, and coming out with some new developments shortly for you. We honestly just want to focus uh, I continue to practice living out what it means to look out for those who are most vulnerable around us. We want to make sure we do that well and take care of those people very, very well. Hey, we've been talking about summer next steps. We've been talking about uh, getting together as a church and hanging out. I have a date for you to put on your calendar. So if you have your phone or your paper calendar, or if you're at home, check this out. June 6th. We'll be meeting at Sunnydale Park after church. We are going to have some food, some fellowship. We're going to celebrate all the graduates in the room. We have some high school graduates. We got some college graduates. We got some graduate graduates. We're going to celebrate all the graduates in the room at that time, as well as just get together as a church uh, to hang out, to get to know one another. Also, you can challenge me in every sport that I said I'm good at up here. I would love it. Bring your bag set, bring a long chair, bring any outdoor activity that you want to bring and share with other people. Also invite your neighbors. It's a good time to bring your neighbors out to see what we're all about. It's a good time to bring your neighbors out to meet your church family, to meet your small groups, just to meet our church. So invite a neighbor, invite friends. We talk a lot about serving here at 16A Community, Community Church, and we actually have a new serve team opportunity for you. Hey, maybe prayer is what you do. Maybe prayer is something that you're looking to do all the time. We're actually going to start a prayer ministry, a prayer team right here at 168 Community Church. We will have an informational meeting after church on June 13th right here. We'll talk about what our prayer team looks like, what we're expecting out of our prayer team. Honestly, this would be the team that will help us continue to set and move our, our culture forward as far as prayer. When we talk about prayer over self-reliance, we're going to talk about what that actually means and put that into practice as a team. So June 13th, informational meeting. If you are interested in hearing more about our prayer team here at 168. As always, we don't take your generosity for granted. There are three different ways for you to give on the screen behind me. You can either give online, you can give in the box to my left, or you can mail a check to that address on the screen as well. We are forever grateful for your generosity. We cannot continue to pursue, participate, reclaim without all of you. Lastly, there's a lot going on in our world. There's a lot going on in our lives. So we just want to take a moment to go before the Father and pray. So bow your heads as Pastor John comes up. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you. God, there's so many words that we want to use to express our gratefulness and our love for you, and they're just not enough. Lord, there's so much going on in our world and in our lives, God. We, you hear all the prayers in this room. You hear all the prayers outside of this room. Lord, we lift those things up to you. We give those things to you, Lord. We put our faith in those things to you and that you have them and that you are going to do what you're going to do with those. Lord, as we wrap up our series today, as we wrap up Beyond Sunday, Lord, may we continue to live in the rhythm of bells. May we continue to live in a rhythm where it allows us to continue to share Jesus to all people in normal rhythms. Lord, we love you and we are forever grateful for all that you are and all that you've done for us and through us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Hey, so we're in our final week of our Beyond Sunday series. And before we actually uh, begin and take a look at Revelation 21, I just want to take some time to actually honor and give attention to Pastor Carl and Liz. So if you guys can come forward for me. 
real quick. Um, so if you didn't know, Carl officially, officially graduated yesterday from <laughs> seminary. And uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. This is for you. There you go. Thank you. We got something else for you. Hey, we just want to take time to recognize that. And honestly, even as we're wrapping up our Beyond Sunday series, what it looks like to live a life that's missional, that's blessing, that's inviting, that's eating, that's listening to the Holy Spirit and living sent. This is a couple that's doing that. And so I thought no better way and no better fit than to be able to honor them, say thank you for toiling through graduate school. Uh, Liz, you know, thank you so much for doing that for Carl. We know it's a family effort. Uh, we just wanted to bless you guys, encourage you, so just hang out with your family, take some time. We know it's been tough. Uh, yeah, long journey. Graduate school is hard, so it's been a long journey. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation chapter 21, Revelation 21, starting in verse 1 to 7, Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. As you turn there, though, I just want to ask you, how many of you, either online, on the stream, or in this room, have a bucket list? A bucket list, something that you want to accomplish before you officially kick the can. Hey, earlier this month, a new Guinness World Record was broken. This guy named Rita, he is a Na Napoli's mountain Sherpa, and he actually climbed Mount Everest, not for the second or fourth time, but for the 20th time he climbed Mount Everest. Mount Everest is, if for you it's hard to understand how high this thing is, it's the Sears Tower, hashtag Sears Tower forever. It's the Sears Tower 19 times high from bottom all the way to the antenna. I'm a novice with that kind of height, and so I thought 19 times Sears Tower, you'd be in space, but you're not in space yet. That's really just the height of Mount Everest. And I had to ask myself, what compels or motivates somebody to climb Mount Everest? Maybe not 25 times, but even just once. And at that moment, I just made a commitment. I don't have a bucket list, but I said, you know what, me too. And by the way, this guy, he was 51 on his 25th time. I said, I'm going to climb Mount Everest too. I made a commitment in my heart. And then I started doing some research and recognized, I don't know if you knew this part of climbing Mount Everest, it costs upwards of $70,000 for you to climb it with all the gear and the training, all the time that you need to set aside. It takes two months to climb up and down. There is a place called the Death Zone. This is, this is the moment where I started praying, saying, God, maybe I'm not called to go to Mount Everest. There's a place called the Death Zone, which is 26,000 feet and above, where you can't breathe and your limbs start to swell. And I said, you know what? I don't think this is for me after all. But I had to continue to ask myself, even as of April 2021, 5,788 different people have climbed Mount Everest. But why? What compels them or motivates them? And I'm going to suggest to you that it's the fulfillment of a future reality. It's a fulfillment of when you're 20,000 feet up in the air and your limbs start swelling. It's a picture of what motivates you to push through. It's a picture of the fulfillment that you will achieve in the future. It's a reality that you see there that compels you to make the decision right now to either continue or to begin that journey. Now, you might have a different fulfillment of reality that you're working towards. Maybe that's the reality of a goal that you have for yourself or proving somebody wrong or wanting to stand on the highest peak like this guy. So today's aim for me as I, and as we look at Revelation 21 is simply this is that the fulfillment of a future reality for Christians or for believers gives us clarity about what we need to do in the present. The future of where we're going, what we're stri striving towards, gives us clarity, gives us clarity for present decisions. And that's what I want to do as we unpack Revelation 21, as we 
finish our series on bells, living out missionally in the daily rhythms of our lives, how does the end clarify the present? Now, I don't know how many of you guys, and this is the object that came to mind for me as we go into Revelation 21. Do you guys own flashlights? Do you own a flashlight? Not your phone. I'm talking about an actual flashlight. Many of us are like, oh, I don't need a flashlight, John. It's called a phone. But I don't know if you've ever been on the side of the road at 10 p.m. when it's raining and you have a flat tire and you try to take out your phone and use it as a flashlight. It's worthless. You can't see because, number one, it's too dim and it's too broad. And I'm going to suggest to you that Revelation 21 is an actual laser. It gives us laser-like clarity about what is to come that it illuminates our present path and decision making to live sent because of the story if you're a believer in Jesus that you get to tell if we're fuzzy about what's going to happen in the future then yeah it's hard for us to decide what decision I should make now because you're just living for the moment but Revelation 21 is written for a reason to give you confidence about what story you're living if you're a believer in Jesus and what story you ultimately get to tell. So Revelation chapter 21, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take a look at there, starting in verse 1. It reads this, Then I saw, this is John writing, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, if you're looking at your text or if you're on your phone, go ahead and circle the word new. Because this word new, it doesn't mean out of nothing, but it means a change in quality. It actually means literally being remade or restored to perfection. Uh, there's a verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We'll put it up for you here. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. But you realize if you're a believer in Jesus and you put your faith in Christ, you don't all of a sudden poof and disappear, right? In 2 Corinthians 5, when it says a new creation, that you have been made new, when Paul writes that to the church in Corinth, he's not talking about you completely disappearing and now existing in a new form. It's talking about how you were once here, but you have been remade, perfected, or being perfected in Jesus. So it's not a non-existence to existence. And that's what we're talking about in Revelation 21. Here's another one. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, we'll put it up here. Jesus says to his disciples, as he's thinking about the second coming, what we're commonly talking about and referring to as heaven, he says, truly I tell you at the, and this is the key word up there, at the renewal of all things. It's the renewal of all things. It's the remaking of all things. It's the restoring to perfection of all things, not the obliteration of all things. So if you go back to Revelation 21, verse 1, when it says, then I saw a new earth, it means then I saw a, watch this, a renewed or perfected or remade heaven and earth. You know, when I was younger, and I actually grew up as a pastor's kid, so I was, in, I was at church all the time. This concept of this new heaven or new earth, right, going to heaven, it actually placed some anxiety in my heart, specifically because as a kid I thought, man, if church is anything, if heaven is anything like church, Sunday morning service, where I have to sit there for 90 minutes to like two hours, and that's what I have to do for eternity? Oh my gosh, I don't want to go there. It just, I'm going to prance around in a diaper playing a harp and Morgan Freeman's going to read the dictionary all day? Like, is that what we're anticipating and waiting for? And John is saying in Revelation 21, no. I don't know if you actually knew this, but the Christian Orthodox faith teaches us that the earth as you know it, right now that you're living in, when Jesus comes back, he's going to re-perfect it. He's going to remake it. So all your senses, all the food that you like, all the things that you enjoy, physically, are simply going to be remade and made new. You don't go into obliteration or it's not just a soul encampment. It's a physical remaking of the world. Here, one pastor puts it like this. 
You can look up on the screen here. It says, in other words, the new heaven and the new earth is everything that we loved about the old heaven that's here and earth minus the curse of sin. Creation's beauties are heightened. Its pleasures are strengthened. Our limitations are removed. What does the glorified heavenly, if you like Hawaii, look like? If what we see now is the cursed version today with our physical eyes, how much more stunning will the new one be if you love filet mignon? That's the best thing you've ever tasted, this side of heaven. Then how much more will you enjoy the glorified version in heaven? We'll experience pleasure without pain, beauty untainted by the curse. Their ice cream and cotton candy are good for you, and broccoli makes you gain weight. In heaven, you're going to experience pleasure without pain, beauty untainted by the curse. You know, if you're a believer in Jesus... We do an incredible injustice for ourselves and for others to say that heaven's going to be boring. You know how hard it is to invite somebody to a boring party? Can you get enthusiastic? Hey, you should, you should, you should come with me to this thing. It's going to be really boring, but I'd love for you to be there. That's a hard invite. But as we're wrapping up the series, it's this new idea of God's making everything that you know here that's tainted and broken by sin right. You think that steak that you had at that steak place was good? Wait until you have the heavenly version. Who cares about grass-fed Kobe beef? Man, that's freshman A class versus what we're going to get to have in heaven. We do an incredible injustice when we make heaven boring. John says in Revelation 21 verse 1 right there, right, that we're being remade in the new heaven and the new earth, that there's a renewal, there's a restoration towards perfection, that the grandest of the Grand Canyon, if that's something for you, is going to be even grander. That the most majestic sunrise you've seen is going to be even more majesticer. I know that's not a word. Take a look at it at the end of verse 1. It says that there was no longer any sea. Now, how many of you guys are mountain people? Mountain people? Versus ocean people. Ocean people? Now, if you're looking at the end of verse 1... You, you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, John, are you telling me that in the new creation, when God remakes the earth, there's going to be no longer oceans and seas? Is that, is that what that's saying? The word sea for Jewish culture as the audience was receiving in Revelation 21, for them, the sea actually meant everything that was rebellious, chaotic, and filled with danger. So if you look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, which is just a few chapters before, Revelation 13, verse 1, it says, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. In Daniel chapter 7, which is from the Old Testament, it says, And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. Even if you are the most ocean person, I guarantee you, you're not going swimming if you see this. You're not. The point that John is making in Revelation chapter 21 at the end when he says no longer any sea, he's talking about there's no longer going to be any type of chaos in the new creation. There's no, there's no longer going to be any type of disorder, any type of hurt or heartache. Because if you actually take your finger and go to Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 to 2, it says that in the middle of this new city there's a river flowing through it. So it's not the fact that there's no longer going to be any bodies of water. It's, it's talking about how there's no longer going to be any chaos. Now, if you turned on the news this week, or if you're a follower of the news, and this is just what's getting reported, right? But even just last night, that means in the new heavens and the new earth, there's going to be no more missiles being launched into Gaza where 12 women and 8 children were killed this morning. There will no longer be a global COVID crisis, especially in India and Brazil as people are turned away from the hospital and they're dying. It means that the personal pain that's represented in this room and the ones that you know of will cease. It will no longer exist. 
If you're a believer in Jesus, can I, can I just say this to you? If you're a believer in Jesus, you have an incredible story to tell. One that is not filled with choir practice, eternal choir practice. One that is not filled with, oh yeah, but this is kind of the right thing to do and we should live this way, you know, because, but it's a new earth that God is making that we get to participate in and be a part of. It's the greatest story that you can invite somebody to. If you skip ahead just a few verses, and we'll cover it again, but if you look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, it's a place where there's no more death. And maybe you've been to a Christian funeral where the pastor talks about there's no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order, the old earth has passed away. So here's the first laser-like clarity of the future that propels you to live beyond Sunday in the present. As you live on mission, here's the first one, is that the renewal of the earth gives you, if you're a believer, a greater story to tell as we recognize that what is currently is not what will be. What you see now, what you have now, what you experience now is not the end. So you get to tell that story as you bless, eat, listen, you learn, as you lift scent, that this is not it. Maybe your heart resonates with that. Look at verse 2. It says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. So if you're looking at Revelation 21, verse 2, we have to figure out who is the holy city and who is the new Jerusalem for us to understand this text. Who is the, who is the new Jerusalem and who is the holy city referred to in verse 2? And in Isaiah 62, you can write this down. We won't look at it, but in Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 to 2, Isaiah refers to Jerusalem or the new Jerusalem to the Jewish people of God. Now, in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, because of the work of Jesus and his death on the cross, it is no longer just the Jewish people, but the new city, the new Jerusalem, are both Gentiles, who are not Jewish, and Jews together. In 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about this new building that is being brought up. So if you go back to Revelation 21, verse 2, the new city in the new Jerusalem is the new Christian church. It's believers gathered together. And if you have some history or background with Christianity, I want you to notice, even in chapter 21, verse 2, in Genesis chapter 3, watch this, it starts with a garden, but in Revelation 21, it ends with a city. Do you know why it starts with a garden and ends with a city? Because in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, it talks about all nations, tribes, tongues, language, and peoples. In Genesis 3, it was a small group. It was Jewish folks who were a part of this new creation coming and making. But through the work of Christ in Revelation 21, it's a new holy city that's inclusive, new language, New ethnicity, new people, new tongues. Now this imagery of bride in verse 2, what does it mean to be perfected in this way, for the people of God to be perfected in this way? Now if you ask my wife Tiffany, she'll tell you I have a tremendously horrendous memory. I, I just can't remember things. Right, so she, she'll come up to me and she's like, hey, remember last year when you were playing with your son? And I look at her and I go, no, I don't. I genuinely just can't remember it. I have a very bad memory, but I'm ne- I will never, I will never, and I cannot forget my wedding day. Because humanly speaking, the wedding day, who is it all about? The groom. No, it's about the bride, right? The groom gets nothing. I remember my wedding day, the ceremony starts, and me and my groomsmen, we don't even get to walk down the center aisle. We just get kind of shushed in on the side. And I don't get to walk in alone, but I have to have an entourage of these groomsmen, you know, just following me. Also, nobody stands up when I walked in. And I don't get to wear all white for some reason. 
Wedding day, humanly speaking, it's all about the bride. The bride, if you're inside a building, they close the doors for you. I didn't get any closed doors. I had to open my own door. Am I bitter about it? Yes. The door is open, and she still doesn't come in. The music starts playing. It's dramatic effect. The door's open. She begins to walk in, adored in this beautiful white dress. And I remember standing there looking at my bride-to-be and saying, wow, I get to be a part of this beautiful internal, external person for the rest of my life. You know what Revelation 21, 2 is talking about when it's talking about this renewing and remaking of people who are believers in Jesus? The imagery is the moment where even a person with horrible memory will remember because it's such a significant day. It's a moment where we recognize that everything, watch, everything that is wrong with you as a believer, and I'm, not, and I'm talking specifically if you have been burned, and we'll get to this, okay? If you've been burned, cut, or stabbed in the back by another believer or Christian. Revelation 21.2 is the moment where that person, even as they hurt you, but they're claiming to be a follower of Jesus, now become wholly perfected and made new again. Where there's total alignment between them saying, I follow Jesus and their actions. Here, it can't be because we're not remade perfectly new again. Even as a pastor, absolutely I make mistakes. In the new creation. And this is what it's talking about. It's saying that if in human language, a human person on their wedding day, dressed in white, adorned with cosmetics and makeup, and is beautiful and transpires all walking down the aisle, this is the connection. Ready? How much more beautiful will the new people of God be the remade beautiful church, as we saw externally in verse 1, making all things new, including our physical bodies, but transforming our hearts by Jesus, not by us walking down an earthly aisle, but in verse 2, by coming down from heaven, prepared as a beautiful bride by God. I want you to notice in verse 2 the origin of newness. Who is the one that's making all things new? This new bride, these new Christians are coming down perfectly from heaven because God is the one who's sending them. It's not this tainted, sinful me or you. You know, we hear it all the time, and maybe this is your experience. You say, I can't follow Jesus because of Christians. And Revelation 21 is saying, Christians hopefully are telling you, hey, I'm sorry, That's why I need Jesus. Revelation 21, 2 is talking about God. I mean, look at verse 2. It says, I saw this holy city, these new people coming down out of heaven from God. And who's the one who's making it new? Prepared by God himself. You know what Revelation 21 is declaring? Revelation 21, verse 2, is saying that you and I, if you're a believer in Jesus, you no longer need to live in the tension and the brokenness of your own sinfulness, tainted by your inability to live rightly. What Paul says in Romans 7, 15, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't. But what I hate, I do. You ever feel that way? It's saying, if you are inclined towards a short temper, and I'm, I'm specifically addressing just all the Christians right now. If you're inclined towards a short temper, 
self-consciousness, always worrying about your image. Will they like me? Will they love me? Will they respect me? If you're inclined towards jealousy, anxiety, heartbreak, whether done by you or done to you, harshness, judgment, bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness, lies, if you break promises either to you or done or, or by you, or even unfulfilled good desires that you might have. Revelation 21 is saying that in the new creation, your new bodies will be made new, but you will be perfected where every single desire, even good ones that are unfulfilled, will be superseded by the presence of Jesus. You know, earlier I said, I asked if you, maybe as a believer or even as a non-Christian, have ever been hurt or been cut down or backstabbed or treated poorly by a Christian. I'm sure you have. I really hope that Revelation 21 is an encouragement to you. That it's a cry of, hey, this is where we're headed to. This is where we're going towards. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I need the one who is, and his name is Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, verse 23, we'll put it up here on the slide for you. It says, not only so, and see if you identify, but we ourselves, we groan inwardly, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, as we wait eagerly, for our adoption to perfect sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So what is the second way that Revelation 21 provides greater laser-like clarity about the future, about what story you get to tell as you live on mission? The second one is that the renewal of the Christian church gives us a greater story to tell as we recognize that what is is not what will be. You know, it's really funny how uh, God works. Just this week, uh, Carl and I were sitting probably on Tuesday with a pastor. And uh, the pastor said this to us. Uh, He said, we need to, as leaders of the church, and again, I just want to speak to Christians. He said, we need to, as leaders of the church, fully acknowledge that the mission and the vision of the church is not to protect the pastor, but to protect the mission of God. Meaning that church leaders don't exist to cover up for other pastors or insiders when they fail or make mistakes, but to make sure that our primary call as a church is to move the mission of Jesus Christ forward. That's it. We own it. And I want to be a church and people, when I make mistakes, which I will, to own it in grace, but also with forgiveness. To say, hey, what is right now is not what will be. And when I mess up, I'm sorry. The renewal of the Christian church gives us a greater story to tell as we recognize that what is is not what will be. Let's close it out. Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 3, and we're going to read all the way to verse 7. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making every single thing new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Verse 6, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. For those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Go back to verse 3 and find the word dwelling, dwelling, God's dwelling with his people. You know, around 10 years ago, uh, I, my friend and I, we went to Las Vegas. Now, some of you are thinking, Pastor John, you went to Las Vegas? 
Others of you are like, oh, no, no, he went to go tell people about Jesus. Uh, my friend and I, we went to Las Vegas because we got this crazy deal where it was an all-inclusive breakfast, lunch, and dinner buffet with a stay at the hotel that had six pools, unlimited crab legs, steak, dessert, appetizers, and food for $25 per person. You would go to Vegas too. I wish it was the holy reason, right? Like, ah, I went on mission. No, I just went because it was $25. Uh, But when we got there, uh, I remember this one time, the elevators opened, and the elevators were probably maybe right here in the first row, and there was, it was a fight night. It was a ultimate fighting championship fight night, if you know what that is, MMA. The elevators were open, and this guy named Matt Sarah walked out. Matt Sarah, he's a champion. He beat GSP. You're like, you mean GPS? No, GSP, right? This, and he was a champion. He's now retired. But he walked out, and he was right in the prime of his fighting season. And my friend who was with me looked at me and said, dude, it's Matt Sarah." And I looked at him and I said, it's Matt Sarah. And he looked at me and said, let's go. Like, let's go say hi. And I said to him, dude, it's Matt Sarah. And he's like, I know, let's go. And I said, dude, it's Matt Sarah. (laughs) And he left me and he went to go say hi. And I just kind of stood there all frozen in awe of the fact that Matt Sarah just walked out of the elevator. You know, as we think about this God dwelling with us, isn't it true that the magnitude, listen to this, that the magnitude of the person's presence determines the magnitude of awe that we experience? Isn't it true that the magnitude of the person's presence determines the magnitude of awe that we experience? Revelation 21, verse 3, when it says, there was a loud voice from the throne saying that God's dwelling place is now among the people, that's actually a scandalous statement for these people. It's scandalous. You know why it's scandalous? Because in Exodus chapter 28, verse 35, watch, it's talking about when a high priest gets to enter the Holy of Holies where God is present one time a year. You know this whole thing that we're doing right now? They got to do it one time a year. One person did. One time a year that was specifically chosen. Exodus 28, 35 tells us that they had to put bells around their waist because when they entered into the Holy of Holies, they wanted to make sure that that person was still alive. Because of the all, because of the magnitude of all, and the grandeur that is God. Revelation 21, verse 3 says, all of a sudden I saw a vision where God is now dwelling with his people. It's scandalous. It's this crazy countercultural theology and idea that is completely opposite of Exodus 28, where only one person gets to go in one time a year with specific gold plating that says, holy is God, and you have bells around your waist. And now because of the presence of Jesus, and as we talked about a few weeks ago, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit that indwells you as a believer, you get to be with God not one time, what time a year, but 24-7, all the time, access Whenever you need it, whenever you want it, whenever you don't want it, God's dwelling is with you. But in Revelation 21, verse 3, it's perfected. It's a perfect dwelling of God. Because if you're following with me, John, you're saying, John, I thought a few weeks ago you told us that if you're a believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, who is God, comes and dwells within you. So what do you mean that all of a sudden now God's dwelling is coming in Revelation 21 3, and that's kind of what we're looking forward to? I thought the Holy Spirit is already in us. I know it's COVID season, and you probably have stopped showering a lot. You're like, I don't need to shower. Zoom can't catch it. You know, I I just don't have to shower anymore. But here's a simple question. When you shower, what happens to the mirror? It gets steamy, right? And it gets cloudy. It doesn't change the physical reality of whether you're standing there. But it does change the reality of clarity, of whether you can see yourself clearly in the fogginess of the mirror. In Revelation 21.3, and we'll put this up here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, it says this, 
For now we see in a mirror dimly. Right? So meaning now, although we have the presence of the Holy Spirit as Christians, and this is the story that you get to tell. For now we see in a mirror dimly, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but then in the new earth, in the new heaven, we get to see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. The reality of the steamy mirror doesn't change whether you're there or not, but it does change the clarity in which you can see yourself. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, when the dwelling place of God comes, it's saying now you can see God and Jesus and experience the fullness of God living in you in its utter, complete, perfect fullness. It's no longer Exodus 28, once a year, it's no longer even you and your brokenness and my brokenness where we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but we still do Romans 7.15, doing what we ought not to do, but when I want to do it, perfect dwelling of God, making it all right, making it all correct, healing all things. And if you're a believer in Jesus, you get to tell that story. And so the final laser-like focus that Revelation 21 gives to us as we live missionally is simply this, that the renewal of God's presence with us gives us the greatest story to tell. The presence of God in us as we live sent. You know, throughout this message, we're going to wrap up here. I've talked a lot about food. I've talked about filet mignons and how it's going to be great. Lobster. Whatever your jam is. Artichoke, is that yours? I don't know. I feel like pastors always come up here talking about steak and never artichoke. We're sorry about that, whether it's artichoke. You know, if you ask me, hey, John, what's your favorite food? I would have told you it's free food. But now I want to correct myself and say it's good free food. Because right? I don't have to buy it, prep it, cook it, make it, put it on a plate. I just get to eat it. That's all I want to do. I just want to eat good food. Do you realize that everything that we've talked about in Revelation chapter 21, if you look at verse 6, it says, if you're thirsty, it's, I'm, I'm giving this all to you freely. If free food is good, God's saying in Revelation 21, if you don't know God this way, it's free. Are you thirsty? Guess what? I'm going to give you the water of life where you will never be thirsty. Are you hungry? You'll never go hungry again because I am the bread of life and my name is Jesus. Do you need healing? I am the perfect physician who can heal you. And guess what? Totally free. Totally free. So if you're watching this or if you're in this room and you haven't accepted Jesus, this is the reality in which you can live into. And it's absolutely free. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't do enough to make your entrance into heaven. He says it's free. You can have it. So if that's you and if you're on the stream, just leave us a message. We'd love to chat with you. If you're here, come and find us. We'd love to talk to you and talk to you about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. So if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. We're going to close with this song called Hosanna. And Hosanna simply means praise or adoration. And in one of the verses of the song, it says, Break my heart for what breaks yours, everything I am for your kingdom's cause, as I walk from earth into eternity, and it's talking about how as we are living here, that we would sing Hosanna, that we would adore and worship Jesus because our hearts break for what break His, because our lives are living for what He desires our lives to be living for. Not twiddling our thumbs, waiting for eternity, but living sent for His kingdom cause. God, I pray 
that you would allow us who are believers in Jesus to know that you have entrusted to us the greatest, greatest story that we could ever tell. That the new heaven and the new earth is not something that's boring, where we sit around and do church all day. But it's everything that we've experienced on this earth in its full perfect state, in its glory, where any unfulfilled longing in our hearts are perfectly superseded by the fulfillment that is found in Jesus. I pray that that would motivate us to live a life that is sent, of invitation, of blessing, of eating, of inviting, of listening to your Holy Spirit, learning more about you, because there's nothing greater that we can do with our lives. God, I pray for the person in this room or on the stream that doesn't know you, or maybe has been even hurt very deeply by Christians or church leadership. I pray that you would extend healing and that you would invite them to come to know you as you are. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're able, would you stand here in the room and also on the stream as we close with the song?
living on mission in your neighborhood, in your workplace, with your family. The whole point of the series that we've been on is that we want to live beyond just Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon. That there's something greater to the Christian life than simply gathering corporately to sing, which is good. To hear about God's word, which is good. But that in a natural rhythm of life for us to live sent in this way because you have been charged with the greatest story of everything that's broken being made new again. And one of the things that we've been trying to do um, as a church is simply for you to get to know one another. And as a church plan, I know relationships, it can be awkward in the beginning when it's when you don't know somebody or there's something not to really talk about. But if you go ahead and take a look at your chair right now, uh, there's little strips of paper and there are three different questions. And it's, would you rather, would you rather, all right? And if you are able to, what we love to do is at the end of the service, just find somebody that you don't know in the spirit of blessing them, getting to know them, encouraging them, just connecting with them. Ask those questions. Say, would you rather do this or that? If you'd rather do it outside because it's beautiful outside, you could do it outside as well. But again, the point is just to relationally connect, get to know one another, get to know each other's story so that we could encourage one another towards Revelation 21. Um, so thankful that you're here. So thankful that we get to worship Jesus together. You have 168 hours this week. Let's go live for Jesus. Have a great week. Thanks.